this way, click to start. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Belonging. Um, and this week, I am really, really pleased to have with us, I say this every week, but um, this week I had a conversation with Richard um, Ofrio, and he is a professor of musculoskeletal sciences at the University of, Sci of Southampton, but he's so, so much more. And I just really want to welcome him to the platform where we can discuss his experiences of belonging and how he's got to where he is right now. So Richard, thank you once again for um, agreeing. And I'm gonna kick off by just asking the question of what is it or what was it that gave you that early sense of belonging, identity, when you were growing up as a child? Oh, Wayne, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for the kind invitation. And um, I, I'm just so pleased to be able to join this platform. Um, so, so a little background, if you like. Um, I was born in London, went to Nigeria uh, within nine months. Um, I had quite a privileged upbringing, to be fair, mm -hmm. um, in, in Nigeria. And then my father gained a scholarship to the University of Bristol in 1967. Mm -hmm. And he came over to Bristol with my mother and for the uh, slightly older members of your community listening in on this, the Nigerian civil war broke out and I was trapped in the, uh, what was Biafra then. And mm. I, I was actually lifted out by the British Red Cross um, three weeks before the war ended. So my wow. life could have taken many different trajectories. Yeah. Um, but in terms of what has really shaped me, what has really instilled me, uh, a, a number of things I'd like to touch on today. M my father was an absolute rock. Yeah. Uh, one of those silent people that instilled tremendous confidence, uh, like many of the people we've interviewed before, he brought out the concept of the power of education. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can imagine in 1967 to gain a scholarship from Nigeria to go to Bristol, yeah. was relatively unusual. He'd already had a scholarship to go to New York in 63. Yeah. So he, he understood the power of education and that's something that's never escaped me. And even arriving back in, in Bristol in those early days, so this is, we're talking 1970s Bristol, there were a number of issues, yeah. a number of racial tensions in yeah. 70s Bristol. Again, some of your listeners may not be aware, um, but education was really important. And three things that came out was the sort of the mentors, the champions, all of those things. And, and we can touch on that later. But the, if you like, my father kept us really grounded ferocious work ethic that has been instilled in me uh, and that has really shaped me and made me who I am um, but also that resilience that I, I, I tried to develop from my father but I couldn't have a fraction of what he had and what he went through. Yeah so, so your father sounds like he was a very powerful um, instrumental um, role model not oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sadly, he died in December last year. Yeah. And so I'd love him to have heard this interview. You never get a chance to tell the people that really matter sometimes. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really important. That's something I quickly share with everyone out there. Do it now. <laughs> um, but but um, he was a, a quiet person, you know, that quiet steel. And, and that's really helpful. And that, um, mm. as I said, the there are so many examples of racism we touched on the other day. Yeah. Uh, just one for your audience was, so my father did a, he worked at the public health laboratories in, in Bath. And um, at the Roman Baths in, in, in Bath, there was a, a Legionnaire's um, outbreak in the sort of 70s and 80s. And, and the press came round and, and they came into the PHLS laboratories and he was the senior um, scientist there. And, in this room that, uh, so, so where's the virologist? And my father sat in the room behind the desk. I'm the virologist. And the number of times he was asked, where's the virologist? But let's, let's, that's just to give you a flavor. So in some ways things haven't changed, but he didn't let any of that affect him. And that's been really important for myself and for my twin. We, it, it's really helped and shaped us. You've got a twin brother. I have a twin, yeah. Okay. Um, and so, 
for the two of you, let me just, before I, I want, want to um, look at that whole transition from um, you going to, coming from Nigeria to, to the UK and how that affected you. Um, but also the, the point which you just touched on about your father, kind of like what he had to endure in terms of, I'm just thinking about it when I think about the fact that he was the head of, effectively the head of a, a research unit, right? Back in the 19, um, 1980s. Yeah? 70s and 80s. 70s and 80s. And to have risen to the prominence of that position but yet it's still being overlooked. Oh, I, I, he could. He, he told us many stories, and uh, and in some ways things haven't changed, um, mm -hmm. which is disappointing. And I, and I hope it really does change for my daughters. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he, I remember him telling me that in 1963 he was in New York. One of the first things that they all agreed on, as soon as they were stopped by the police, and they, these were young men fashionably dressed, enjoying the high life from Nigeria in New York. Uh, you always tend to think of your parents as old and whatever, but some of the photographs is just, this is a man who knew how to live. Uh, but he was, again, he was just instilling this thing of, yes, sir, no, sir, here's my ID, anything I can do for you. And, and we're talking 1963, mm -hmm. but has anything really changed 60 years yeah. ago? It, and, yeah. and that's the disappointment. Um, yeah. Again, I remember in the 80s, Rodney King, it's 30, I think probably coming up to 30 years now, yeah. and he was assaulted in Los Angeles, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but again, in many ways, things haven't changed that much. But he, he tells a number of stories and, and how you need to rise above it. And he mm -hmm. rose above it. He didn't let any of it affect him in the slightest. And I think that really helped my brother and myself, that idea that, Knowledge is power. It's something I tell all my students. Knowledge yeah. is power, and education matters. Yeah. And, and and so that those are sort of little nuggets, if you like, that I've held, held on to, and I think yeah. they're really, really important. Yeah, I should, no, I think that's that. I think you're absolutely hundred percent right. And your dad uh, rest his soul, but it would have been a brilliant. It would I would have loved to have also have had a conversation with him about his experiences. Absolutely. Uh, because I, I can hear just through you the, the, the power and the influence which he has kind of like instilled in you. Yeah. Let me just take you back again. That, that transition, I'm going to go, I keep going back to that transition because I really like to understand the whole concept of, of what influences helped you to get to where you are now. And I understand your father was a powerful influence in terms of driving education, but you did have that transition from... Yeah. Um, being in Nigeria and coming over to the UK and the time when you came into Bristol and we know the kind of racial tensions which were going around the Bristol <laughs> boycotts and all of that so, so, so tell me about that for, for you because that was the, your the, lived experience the fact there were there were a couple of things so as you'll have gathered family is really important and of course yeah. Nigeria we were very privileged. We had this extended family, etc. And then when we came here, it was very limited. And there were a couple of things that that really helped. And again, I'm a great believer in mentors. And I was incredibly fortunate. I went to Westbury Park Primary School, and I had my very first mentor in Bristol at Westbury Park, a man called Mr. Gutzel, head teacher. And for whatever reason, he took my brother and I under his wing. I mean, we were a novelty factor. There's no doubt about it. The school was, I, I think we were the only mixed. Uh, there were very few, anyway, I can't remember. Um, mm -hmm. But there were very few black and mixed uh, race children at Westbury Park. But he took us under his wing. The refugee factor was a real novelty for a lot of the children at that time. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that was, it was really important to have someone who looked beyond all of that, mm -hmm. who was just interested in our well-being, and mm -hmm. actually gave us extra lessons. You have to remember at the time, I didn't, so we did use to speak English when we were at home, etc. Mm -hmm. And then of course, during the war, a lot of it reverted to Igbo. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, when we came back, our English was somewhat rusty. Yeah. And he, within a year, spent, personally and with other teachers, 
she asked that extra lesson. That, having that mentor, having someone who believes in you, someone who yes. just says, look beyond all of the, the backstory and just mm -hmm. in the moment, we're going to get you where you want to be. You've got the ability. You've got the talent. I, I'm really fortunate. I didn't suffer from the, you can't do this. Right, it's, yeah. the, it's the, I believe you can do this. Your father tells me, your parents tell me. The other thing about some of the racial elements, this is just to add to this. My mother's Irish. Right. So just think about black <laughs> and Irish in 60s England. Yeah. You, couldn't, you couldn't even get a house. Thank you. <laughs> so my again one of the things that they told and so that this leads to quite a strong bonding within the family if you like because if you think about it that they can remember going to look at property and then it was oh it's been let it's been it, it's not available as soon as they saw it was either my father or because my mother was irish and it, this is in the early 60s so it's it's just yeah. incredible um, so I, I, in many ways, I've had it very, very easy. Mm. I, I can't match what my parents went through. And that, that's an important, if you like, a lesson to hold on to. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can, I, I understand that family intertwined and the challenges of one doesn't necessarily manifest itself in the same way, but the resilience that they give you helps you to overcome whatever challenges you, you I will think, face. I think what happens is the resilience becomes important or you understand that the defining power it gives yeah. and, and the importance of controlling your own destiny. Yeah. That is so, so important. And, and we all need champions. Mm -hmm. We all need networks. Mm -hmm. We all need mentors. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you've got to control your own destiny as much as you can. Yeah. And, and you got to try and do everything in your power to allow you to do that and, yeah. and and that's where the mentors come in and the champions come in and you've got to build your own network and yeah. that's why things like this are fabulous yeah thank you well, i'm just thinking on then so you had that champion in primary school going into secondary school you had that inner belief your father instilled that inner belief your yeah. teacher was instilling your inner belief so then in terms of career options, universities and stuff like that, yeah. was that continued? Was that perpetuated during yeah, your secondary so education? I, I, you know, I have to be fair. My, my father and, and my schools were well, supportive. I didn't have anything about you won't get to university. Yeah. Okay, that, that was not an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think what really was really important was the fact that there was that support to allow me to go to university. There was that support right. to allow me to go first yeah. to Liverpool, then to Oxford. None of these were an issue. Yeah. Um, what was an issue for me, and I can share this with, with your listeners, was um, I've always been in bone. Okay, so bone is my passion, you know. I, I, I want to know how to repair bone. I want to understand how to make bone and cartilage. And I want to translate to the patient. Yeah. That's what it's all about. You know, if I can take the marrow, the stem cells out of your arm, put them on a scaffold, and we can start looking at tissue engineering, that gets me excited. Right. And, but in 80s America, when I went to do my first postdoc, uh, so I, I told you this on Wednesday, I used to have fabulous Afro. It's all gone now. Um, but... but there weren't many black or mixed race children. Yeah, Omar wants pictures. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, um, I've lost my train. Yeah, trying to do bone research, trying to understand skeletal research, trying to understand muscular skeletal. And, and this is where Greg Mundy, he, he led one of the top three bone labs in the world. Um, and I went and did my first postdoc with Greg. And Greg said to me, it, you know, don't do, don't become that angry young black man. And don't show any of that. He said, rise to the top, rise as far as you can and make the difference from within. Lose the Afro, put on a tie, join the club and make the difference. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, mm -hmm. but in 1980s America, that's what was going to make the difference. Okay. So it, it was, yeah. it was, sorry, carry on, carry on. And so it, it, it was just that I did want to rise to the top. I did want to make a difference. And, and it took a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can maybe discuss why it took so long to, to do mm -hmm. that. But with people like Greg as my champion, I was able to get 
I went to Zeneca, I went back to Oxford, and I've been at Southampton for 20 plus years in Southampton. Yeah. Again, I had another champion and mentors. Mm-hmm. And, and so I'm a great believer in seek out that mentor. You do need to have a champion who's going to help you rise to different positions of power. And then most importantly, when you can make that difference. And that's the carry. I, I like I like the, the illustration which you give about Greg in terms of his um, advice which he he offered you to say is there's there's ways that you can get through in this you can be the not the rebel but you can be kind of like I'm going to kick this door down or you can try and be pragmatic and I'm going to say I'm going to get them to open the door for me yeah yeah I, I'm so, not saying I'm not saying it's right no I know yeah but in but in 80s Texas. Okay? Yeah. So just, you know, for your listeners saying this is 2021, you shouldn't have to do that. But, mm-hmm. you know, think back to maybe they weren't born in 80s Texas, but mm-hmm. 80s Texas, which if, if those of you don't know, they just introduced a six week abortion mm-hmm. bill. So, you know, there are quite stringent views and strong views across the whole range of platforms to consider. Um, it, it's really important to be able to to be seen as a serious academic. So as a postdoc, I couldn't have made any difference, but with, with the research, the ability to show that you can deliver, the ability to show that you, you have currency in, in that space, that becomes important. I, you know, I, I, I fully appreciate that. And I, I really like what you've done in terms of you've mobilized and you've been able to get to a position where you can now um influence okay uh, would you would you say that i mean it sounds very grand okay so i don't want, i don't want to yeah so i don't want to, i don't want to overplay it mm-hmm. but but certainly i i'm now in a so a couple of years ago i had the idea about the cowrie scholarship foundation yes. so the cowrie scholarship foundation wants to take disadvantaged black british students and allow them to attend our uk universities if we think about somewhere like the russell group imperial one of the big plays in the russell group the numbers of disadvantaged Black British students is shocking. And I'm not just saying that, the Russell Group report from May last year stated it themselves as a real problem to be addressed. Um, And with the tragic events of George Floyd, I really wanted to to really call out and to really try and push that agenda. Mm -hmm. Um, There were a lot of performative statements from many sectors Mm -hmm. and so, I've had this idea for a couple of years, but it wasn't possible. But now it was possible to, to make a few phone calls. Mm-hmm. I do know a few people in the right space. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really helpful. Mm-hmm. And, and so I have that currency, that credibility that you can Google me, you can find out who I am. Do I direct a center? Have I made a publication? Have I done a research? They, they could work out that it, it wasn't, I told you this, it wasn't a Nigerian scam. Okay. And, and, <laughs> I mean, that's a really sad thing to hear, but but it's it's just where we are. Yeah. And so today we have 14 universities that have signed up and that is just fabulous. Mm. We have mm. universities committing around 1.4 million for tuition, for tuition fees. So we, we have that traction, but where we lack that, credi- that credibility of traction is with business. Mm-hmm. So... If you can just expand a little bit about about what your foundation is aiming to do. I know you said that you want to, have you set a target on the numbers which you'd like to? Yeah, yeah, no, so we're we're quite clear about this. So um, I wanted 100 within the decade. Right. Okay. Um, And that was essentially every university signs up for one student covering their tuition fees every three years. Mm -hmm. If 33 universities sign up, we've got our 100 students in a decade. It's a drop in the ocean, Yeah. but uh, this is a family run concern that now has a fantastic trustees board yeah. and friends of Cowrie that makes it possible. Uh, and so we have 50 students now, so we're halfway there in a year yeah. in terms of tuition fees. Uh, and of course the real, the real pull is, can we get business to match that? Mm. And these, these students will have full scholarships. They'll have £8,000 a year for their living costs and they'll have tuition paid. And we will be taking disadvantaged students who don't enter many of our universities going to universities. That, that, that's the vision. And that's what we're trying to do. 
so far to go, but that's where we're at. No, I, I, I think it's an excellent idea. Um, one of the things which, when I've done my little bits of research, is about the, the idea of numbers. The idea of numbers that although you put you can put somebody into an environment, but if the environment isn't conducive for them, so it's the, the reflection the, of self is critical. Yes. Okay. I, I, I've been in, in senior management meetings. Mm -hmm. Reflection of self is a real issue, and we know that whether it's in law, whether it's in the NHS, whether it's mm -hmm. in academia. I, I mean, I saw on Twitter today somebody was asking, "Are there still only thirty six female black female professors?" I mean, there are twenty three thousand in the UK, so that just puts it into perspective. Yeah, there's one hundred and fifty four. There was when the report came out, one hundred and fifty five black male professors. Yeah, you know, so the numbers are, are vanishingly small. Yeah. And, you know, we, we could talk about that for hours, but, but we, yeah. if that just shows this, it's really important to build that network, to really build that community. And I'm not a great believer in people who pull up the drawbridge when they've made it, mm -hmm. but that's mm -hmm. just personal and I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with that as well. But I, but I suppose the thing which I'm, I'm, I'm very keen and interested in finding out is because you've talked about mentors and for many of these young people, um, it may be that they don't have those mentors available. They don't have those champions who's going to promote their causes. And they don't have the individuals in high enough positions who will be their champions. So how do we as a kind of like community of academics who I see on, on our, our panel today, how what, what more can we do to support each other, to support the, the, the young students you're, you're, you're absolutely right it every university will tell you oh we've got we've got um, we've got all this covered we've got various yes. forums but actually what people want is a safe space mm. somewhere there where they can they will not feel threatened or they don't want to be nobody's asking for special favors mm. what people are wanting is an understanding and and real input and, and wanting to make a difference and not a tick box exercise mm -hmm. yeah a, a lot of edi activities can be performative tick box ex exercises but the black in geoscience black in neuro there are a number of these really exciting groups looking to help yeah. and i would say to a student just reach out to whichever sector you're in and there are lots of them and the yeah. other thing is um reach out to your academics and you can drop them quickly but you can also find out are they really the ones that if you can't if you can't get a, a rapport you don't want them as your mentor i've got three or four and i've been mentors but ooh, the longest is 33 years okay so that that just shows you you yeah. know when you find the right person you've just got that synergy no, I, I i i like the idea I've got a couple of mentors in here right now who, who yeah. I really do look up to. Yeah, Donald, so you want to save spaces. People, they're not going to make a judgment. They're, they're not going to say what's right or wrong. Yeah. They're going to be that listening board. Yeah. And, and I mentor a few people. And it's it's one of the most rewarding things you can do is to be a mentor. And I'd say that. Brilliant, brilliant. I'm looking at time and I know that I've got quite a few people on board who, who may well want to have a, a question or two toward okay. them, right? So if anyone's got a question, if you want to put your hand up, otherwise I've got a couple more questions which I would like to um, explore with you, all right? Um, so let me kick off the, the other set of questions because I, I really, oh, all right. All right, William, and then I'll come back to my question. William, <laughs> right, William, you waited until I was just about. Go ahead, William. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, brilliant talk, really good. I just wanted to go go back a bit to just uh, say, how, why bone? Because you said you got a fascination with bones and the skeletal. What what got you into that so, whole area? So it's, it's I, I'm a great believer in serendipity. So when I was at Liverpool, I was, it was actually everything. I did a project and it was all about vitamin A and bone. And it was actually vitamin A that I thought was, was where it was going to be. 
Um, and then when I went to, to Oxford to do my DPhil, I started working on vitamin A in bone. And I became really excited by, there's a cell called, it's called an osteoclast and it eats bone. I, I mean, seriously, this cell type, if you put it on a, a slice of bone, will eat that bone and you can watch it. And I, I was just, oh my gosh, this is fabulous. And then of course you think about this, one in, one in, if we think about osteoporosis, we think about arthritis. So just think about this. One in two women over 50 will suffer a fracture because of osteoporosis. Yeah. I know the cell that eats bone. How do you stop that cell functioning? I know the cell that makes bone and I want to find the stem cell. And I've spent all my life trying to find the bone stem cell. <laughs> and, and it's as simple as that. I was just transfixed. And there's nothing more exciting then trying to understand how you can take a scaffold, you can put cells on it, and you can try and encourage it to make new bone that, that you can put for damaged bone. And as we get older, that's what we want to do. So that was my, if you like, that, that's where I suddenly got this passion to try and make a difference. I love the question, Will. I really love the question. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think of it from that point of view, but that is, it's that fascination. And what came across in your answer? It was the, the passion of the question. The, 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 the question is what keeps driving you and yeah. that curiosity. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if somebody asks me, so I, my DPhil was back in the early 80s yeah. and I, I, it, was, it was called bite me and bone and I was looking at the osteoblast, the cells that makes bone. Yeah. And I've spent all that time till now and now I'm in regenerative medicine and I'm trying to use stem cells and we're trying to make more bone. But I'm still, my, my key driver is, what is the skeletal stem cell? That's what gets me so fired up. Yeah. And how, and how can it... Um, how can we it? harness it? How can we yeah. harness that, yeah. that potential and make, make it do the things we want to do? How close are we to getting the answer? Um, so, so I get asked this question all the time, so I'll stop saying five to seven years, <laughs> which is the standard response in research. I see Donald, Donald Palmer's on the call, so you have heard me say this before. So yeah, yeah, we're getting closer. We'll leave it. <laughs> we're not putting a time limit on it anymore. We're, just saying we're getting closer. I <laughs> no, so, so, no, that's that's absolutely excellent, and. What I love about that is the, the whole idea, again, that it's something else which is really, I can see that it's passionate for you, right? In the same way as the work which you're doing about representation, they're passionate. And so with that, you're able to, how do you, how do you manage to um, fit everything in? How do you get that work-life balance? Yeah, so I, I probably haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't got that. Okay. But, but I, I haven't got that right, and my family will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I really, we have a window here to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the tragic events last year, led mm -hmm. that change in the country, white and black wanting to make a difference. And mm -hmm. some of it was performative, but a lot of it was real. And, and so I, I feel we've got this narrow window before, as I mentioned to you the other day, I've already had the conversations of, didn't we do this last year? Which is just awful. Um, but for me, it's all about, we can make a difference and we've got to push now. Mm -hmm. and, and we've got to get people to understand the, the advantages of in inclusion and diversity. The, the real difference when everyone is at the table. Mm -hmm. and that's the problem. We're not mm -hmm. at the table. Mm -hmm. Since we're not at the table, that is, that is a very... Um, valid point um, but with people like yourselves getting into those positions and being able to help others uh, and, and the, the idea about um, getting there on merit right um, what do you think about that idea of meritocracy is it really merit <laughs> that gets us there oh well we don't live in a meritocracy it's a very loaded question. You, you should know not to ask me that. I'm I've got to be really. I've got to be really careful what I say. This, this is recorded. We don't live in a. We don't live in a meritocracy. It's as simple yeah. as that. Um, mm -hmm. I wish we did, mm -hmm. um, but everything tells us. All the stats tells us. Um, people have conferred advantages, mm. and and that's just where we are today. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things I, I say to, to people is, and, and to my younger self, I wish I'd said it earlier, mm-hmm. knowledge really is power mm-hmm. and mediocrity won't get you where you want to be. I'm mm-hmm. not saying that's right. Yeah. You've got to be the best you can be. Mm-hmm. You've got to do the very best two, three times more than anybody else. That's just what we have. Yeah. That's just the way it is. Yeah. I'm not saying it's right. I wish it wasn't. But we don't live no we don't we basically so so I, I i suppose this is why again i'm going to come back to the idea of the when we were having our discussion earlier on in the week the week um there was three key things which you kind of like identified for me one was mentorship yeah. one was about champions and then the third one was about having established networks and, and networking. Can you just expand upon how that's helped you? So, so hopefully people have understood the mentors and the champions and how yeah. that's helped me. Yeah. But, but in terms of networks, um, so I, I undertake interdisciplinary research. So mm-hmm. if you want to make bone, you've got to have material scientists, you've got to have clinicians, physicists, mathematicians, all of mm-hmm. that. So from a science perspective, that's why you need a network. Yeah. But then from the carry perspective, where I, I really want to see, we're talking about super talent. We're not asking for any favors here, but super talented, disadvantaged Black British students just don't have the funds to go to our universities. Mm-hmm. And the Russell Group is terrible for this mm-hmm. in terms of having representation. So with the networks that I've generated through, I've been in research since the 80s, it's a long time. Yeah. Um, I, I was able to make some initial contacts, some phone calls, and you start off with the, I'm doing this, how's research, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And then you can say, I really need your help. I really need to get this message to the right person mm-hmm. about how can the university partner with the Cowrie Foundation? Mm-hmm. That's what your network will do. And then the other thing is you can use networks for everything from you need a technique, you need an approach, you need a PhD supervisor, you need an examiner. But from the Cowrie perspective, I was able to reach out to people that I, I, and I've known them for decades, and just say, I'm not saying you're in or out, but you share my values, will you help propagate the message? Yeah. That, That becomes really important. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you say that because where I remember seeing you and hearing you articulate um, your passion was when Donald Palmer did his um, event a, a few months back where he was talking about the impact on young people and you were there and I remember listening to you and thinking there's so much insight into what you were saying there and it was because of the network and as Donald calls it, it's a network conversation. So it's bringing people together who may not have been to, may not know how to reach out to each other to come together so that we can have a discussion and hopefully yeah. our collective wisdom can come up with something which will be it's, better it's, than the sum. It's, it's all about the sum of many. It's all That's about right. collective action. Individually, it's really hard. So yeah. you know, when I when I had this first vision in June last year, days after, you know, everyone was traumatized by what happened. Mm-hmm. And I had a blank piece of paper and I had a real wobble about, is anything going to happen here in terms of, I'm gonna to write to a university, I'm gonna say, are you gonna give some money? Universities are financially strapped, we're in the middle of a pandemic. But I decided, right, if I write to 38 vice chancellors, 38 universities, and we just start knocking them over one by one. And Newcastle were fantastic. Professor Chris Day responded in 12 hours by text, I'm in. I mean, and I always shout this out. Mm. That was phenomenal, mm. that was phenomenal. Somebody was in. We, we talked a little bit about allyship, etc. Yeah. There's real allyship and there's performative tick box allyship. Yeah. You know, that, that stepping up to the plate and saying, we're in, we're gonna make a difference. That becomes important. And not, at the end of the day, I don't mind how people join, but it's really important that everybody, everyone has some part to play, they, that there's some part in the jigsaw that they can really help to, to pull together here. Yeah, I love that. I'm just looking and I've just seen that we've got a number of people who have posted things in the chat. I see um, William had another question as well did 
Mike. Mike, can I ask you to ask your question? If that's all right. Or it might be I'll ask it for him. All right. He yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, I am here. Uh, yeah, greetings. It wasn't really a question, actually. Okay. Uh, I'm just making a comment. Um, okay. So I, I'm based at um, a university that's not Russell Group. But what's <laughs> very interesting about UEL, where I'm based, <laughs> is that recently um, there was a brother who was a pro vice chancellor and he left UEL and he got a job as the first black vice chancellor of Leeds Trinity. Mm -hmm. But he's also the first black vice chancellor ever in the UK. Wow. So, so I just think, you know, I think that that says something about how difficult it is to progress through the senior levels of universities. And it's actually those levels that matter when it comes to, um, you know, pushing our community through academia yeah. in terms of seniority jobs and so on and so on. Um, I, you know, I, this is a brother you could invite onto these onto these discussions. I'm sure. Uh, Charles Egbu, yeah, Pref uh, <laughs> Charles Egbu. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, definitely, but, Mike. Thank you so much. I'm going to rephrase it for for Richard uh, just to say, well, there's a challenge there in terms of as Mike has just said about at the very top levels. Have you got any aspirations to get to the very top of vice chancellor? No, I, I when I took on the cowrie, um, that's when I had to decide I wasn't going to be pushing as hard on some of the senior management roles. It's impossible to run the cowrie. Um, I still have my day job. Yeah. Um, and, and so it, it, I'm not stopping anytime soon, but I, you know, I, I, have no, I, I, I know what I can and can't do and I must deliver. That's really important. Fair enough. I mean, the, the point Mike raised about there, are, I think there was, a year ago, there's 540 senior academics. None were black at the highest level. So now it looks like there's an N equals one or N equals two. That yeah. tells you the problem. Academia has this thin veneer um, and is also incredibly eloquent at being able to present a perspective. But it, it's a really difficult piece to think about in terms of how truly inclusive academia can be. And, and it can say, and it, it, it has tremendous skill sets in being able to present a, a certain viewpoint. And if you ever said to the wider public, is there racism in academia? I suspect the general public would tell you, oh no, there's no racism in academia. Academia is a font of knowledge. It's ivory towers, etc." Mm -hmm. But I think the very comment that has just been raised would suggest that there is structural racism and it's very difficult to dismantle that and inroads are being made and there are important differences that that are starting to appear and and i think the universities are trying incredibly hard but this is 2021 yeah thank you for that honest answer um william could you ask your question and sunday i'm coming to you don't worry yeah i think uh, richard i think you mentioned earlier that it you felt it taken you a long time to get to where you've gotten to. And just to elaborate on that, were there barriers that you felt were in the way of, make, of you getting to where you needed to, where you felt you needed to get to? Um, no, to be fair, I, I, you know, I got my chair um, at what, 42, so it, it was okay. Um, so perhaps not, um, but what I did want was to, to be able to have real influence, that takes time. Um, because not just it wasn't just that I got to a chair, it was, and I've been 17, 18 years as a professor here, but it's actually, it, it still takes time to rise up within the professoriate and to have senior roles within the university. That does, that does take time before you can really start to have um, people believe that you're worth listening to. And that, that's just the way it is in academia. Oh, fantastic. Well, it's not fantastic, but I understand what you're, I, I understand that it takes time, unfortunately. Yeah. People, people need to know that you're not a loose cannon and they mm. need to know that it's really important that, that what you can contribute. I think, unfortunately, it takes longer than I would like it to be. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah. OK, Sunday, can you come in with your question, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Amazing conversation. Uh, a gentleman mentioned Charles earlier, who is now the, uh, the uh, rector or the uh, provost of one of the university in Leeds. I used to go for a drink with, Richard, with Charles many, many years ago. I was doing my undergraduate, and he was doing his PhD. So I wasn't surprised. Richard is always, Charles is always a very determined person. He wants to go high, but as you can see, how long it took him to now becomes a, 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 more or less a CEO of, a, of an organization. But we have talent in us, as, as Richard has said, we do. We just need to do something differently. We need to position ourselves. We need to sell ourselves that people will really understand us and, and, and respect us and, and get us to you know, be able to climb that ladder. I have people in my department now that taught undergraduate and they're now full professors and I'm not even a full professor yet <laughs> so you could you can imagine yeah. what we're going to but one thing I'm glad for my department we now have the first black professor in my department it's never been taught about before. actually is that is that Imperial College as well or not is that the first is Washington the first black head of the, head Washington of the, department? Was the first Definitely. oh there you go the first yeah, one Washington. In my and I would tell you what Washington used to tell me when that's when we started Imperial's one 15, 16 years ago. He said, Sunday, I would like I would like to be part of it. But you know, I know where I'm going. So until I finish ticking that box, it's gonna be very difficult for me. But I'm behind you 101 percent So he supported the organization, but he will never show his face. <laughs> I do a lot of outreach work and I will call him the last minute, Washington some 500 or 100 students are down there in the next hour, can you come and say hello to them? And he will leave whatever is, if he's teaching, he will come, he will take a break from his teaching and he will come <laughs> and speak to them for five minutes. Uh, he's into GPS and data and all kind of thing. So Washington is great and we like people like you, Richard. Now that you're in where you are now, this is where you need to pull other people along with you. But my question for you is that uh, you've told us it took longer than you should have taken. What would you have done differently if you have to, you know, go back and, and, and leave that again and, and you know what your target is? What would you have done differently to, to help people like us? I think what I would have done is I would have built on the network very much sooner and I would have called on the network very much sooner. You can't do it on your own. I think that's really important to realize. I, I mean, unless you're some incredibly gifted off the scale individual. But I think the, the power of, of a network, the power of like-minded people and the power of support becomes very, very important. And so I, I would have paid more attention in the early days of my interactions, whereas I've perhaps spent the last 25 years really working on my interactions. I'd have actually said, right, as a postdoc, this is when it really matters. Mm. I mean, these are the people, if you stay in the field for two, three decades, these people will also be in a position of influence. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah that's, that's, a, that's a mistake people like me make. I used to call that sucking up, but you're right, it's not sucking up. It's actually network building. So thank yeah. you very much for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that question, Sunday. It was, it was on point. It was very, very insightful. Um, Donald, I'm not sure if Donald's still with us, but he did put a question in the, 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 the chat. Donald, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you, man. We can hear you. Man. Can I say, um, really inspirational, um, and uh, I really admire what you're doing, and I think the Carrie Foundation is fantastic. And in a way, what, what you, I wanted to ask a question in terms of the future, because what we're seeing and what you're doing is bringing more, more students, more black students to go to university. And more than ever before, we, we now have more and more of a, a diverse body of, of young people going into university. So the question is, is the next steps? And, and how can we encourage more? And I, I really like the point you made about academia being in, inclusive. And that's an area I'd love to discuss with you at another time. So the question really is, how can we now progress our, our, our young people to consider postgraduate studies? Yeah, so, so this, is, this, is, this, is all, this is all about legacy. 
Yeah, because That's the key thing about Cowrie, it's all about legacy. We, we, we're going to have five this year, 14 next year, 100 within the decade and, yeah. and other programs. And those students need to not just great, I got a scholarship or whatever. They yeah. need to build on that and they need to bring others with them. Yeah. And th they need to understand that, yes, I, you know, the degree is only one step. There's the broken pipeline UKRI talked about for PhDs. And yeah. some of the universities are trying to address that broken pipeline. But yeah. it's, again, it's just at multiple points, we need to, to make that push. One of the things I think, and really the question is, is really about how can we get uh, more of our young people to co even consider postgraduate or PhD. So and for so them to do that, for them to do that, they need to realize yeah. the support will be there, the yeah. funding will be there, and that they're not the only ones doing it. Back to, it's back to this reflection of self again. You, you don't want to be the only BME in the department. You yeah. want to be able to understand that this is not so unusual. You want yeah. to be able to have a network that shows lots of people are doing this and this is not unusual yeah. and, and and really the idea is when you look for example at the teaching profession you know and, and Wayne will know this 30 years ago you know when I went to school there were very few black teachers but now in London what you are seeing is, is that there's a large number of black teachers now and they're starting to make a difference in senior leadership etc and I wonder I, what approach they've done and can this be done really to encourage folks to, to go into academia? So there's two- I think, I think a couple of things need to happen is they need to understand that it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful place to be, academia. They need yeah. to understand they can make a difference. They need to understand that they are welcome and that they, they will rise and that they, their contribution is highly valued. And I think if all of those messages change or are perceived to have changed, or that there is a, 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 an ability to actually start to make inroads in so many of these different areas, and that's where the universities have a real role to play. And I think some of them are really understanding that. I think that makes a big difference. Well, no, thank you. Thank uh, you. I guess the, the, the next question is, is that, really relates to the, the wave. Now that we're getting more and more, you know, um, stu not students, but black academics, it's really, the question is, what, what is it, what do they need in order to progress further in terms of promotion? I think it's, it's equality of opportunity. No special favors, no quotas or anything, but equality of opportunity is important. So I, I was in uh, here in Southampton when the Athena Swan was rolled out mm -hmm. and this idea of glass ceilings for women and, and really Dame Sally made a huge, huge step forward by essentially the, there was a, a contribution where there was funding applied to the Athena Swan in NIHR programs. And you couldn't apply for some of these large programs if you didn't have appropriate Athena Swan status. And that meant equal opportunities and promotion and, and making sure that, because the candidates were all there, but they, they weren't being given that equal opportunity. And I think we have a, a wealth of talent in, in the UK um, across all of our, whether it's a postdoc, lecturer, senior, et cetera. The talent is all there, but just giving them that access to opportunity and a level playing field. And, and this is all about reverse mentoring and blind interview panels, et cetera, et cetera. We know all about this from grants and from fellowships, et cetera. We just need to, to adjust some of our mechanisms. Um, it, worked for, it worked for orchestras, blind auditions, transformed orchestra makeup. We can do the same in academia. We just need to start doing it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the okay. question. Oh, right, Richard, I'm, I'm, I'm just wary of time, but I also see that I've got two additional um, questions in the, the chat. So if you wouldn't mind just indulging me a little bit longer, because um, I'd really like to get Deshane on. Um, if Deshane, if you could ask your question, because Richard, you actually kind of addressed it, but Deshane. Hello, sorry. Um, Apologize, I've got that really bad connection on moving, like in the press. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But yeah, no, thank you, um, Prof, for your talk. Um, it was really interesting. Um, I kind of got in a bit late, but got in also at the point where you were talking about the collective. And I've been involved with quite a few of these collectives, but I guess my question really is, is about, well, most of them are student-led um, and trainee-led, so it's, a, it's from the bottom up, I guess. Um, but my question to you is how do we get, well, more collective or, or more of a collective response from the top down? Because, well, there's a lot to be said for increasing representation at the bottom and there's a real problem there. But well, even with regards to UK RRI and um, their COVID response and zero out of what 4.3 million pounds going to to anyone who was black when it was a, at the time something that was disproportionately affecting us. So it's it's that disparity that I see that is definitely more at the top that even if you get more people into, into the institution, you cannot get them to progress upward. Yeah. So like, how do you it's it's uh, it's not going to. I mean, some of the issues have been here for fifty years, so it's not going to happen in the next year. I think what's really important is to think about. It's a dam, and we've just got to keep giving suggestions. It, it, the most important thing is not to protest about it, but to give a solution. OK, um, I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I'm just saying you give a solution to the majority and, and that's what's really important. So we need at all levels across the whole spectrum, we need that ability to say, this is the issue. This is a solution. Have you considered it? And, and essentially, rationale will win in the end. And knowledge is power and as soon as people start to it's a bit like smoking okay you're you're too young but smoking was in the 70s and 80s was a big deal nobody was going to give up smoking now it's completely opposite and it's all about knowledge and it's all about articulating the issues and what we have to do as a community within academia and the same in law and the same in finance the you know the 10,000 black interns fantastic program that's going to make a difference it's all about multiple fronts making sure people understand the issue the majority of people it's not affected they don't know i mean this is a wonderful conversation but i suspect we're all on the same choir here we're, we're not actually talking to the people who need to understand the message what we need to do is be able to get that message into a wider wider approach and i think it needs to be a measured conversation, and it needs to be about, this is the solution that allows you to take something forward and to then try it. Brilliant. Richard, you have been just so frank and honest with us this afternoon. It's been absolutely brilliant. It really has. Um, I'm, I'm taking away the importance of the champions the networks and the mentors, and that we we have to be pragmatic in our approach. And in order, when we're not going to be able to kick down doors, we sometimes need to be able to massage the door open or allow someone to open the door for us, just because of the connection and the relationship that we have with with them. Um, and I, what I'd like to say is just on behalf of Imperial as one and all of the academics who are, are on here, that we support you 100%. 100% in, if you need mentors for the students who are going through the, um, going to be going through your foundation, then Donald, William, uh, Deshane, Sunday, Mark, I'm just looking at all of the names on here that I can see Omar, um, I don't know who Power Hour is, uh, and, Mark, um, and Mike, I'm pretty sure that all of us would be 100% um, behind um, you in saying we will be supporters and, and willing to help in whichever way we can. That, that is uh, wonderful to hear. Thank you for the opportunity to present. That, that's so kind of you all. Um, mm -hmm. And we do need mentors. It, you know, we don't need mentors this year, but we will have 14 students next year. And yeah. we hope to, and that's eight are guaranteed, and we hope to have more the following year, and so on. So, yes, we would like to be able to count on, on people stepping up and just providing a real opportunity for these students to, to relate and to share. And But it's a real commitment. This is not about, hi, how are you, great tick box. Yeah. Yeah. These are students that will need nurturing and support and time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That's, no, that's I, I, will, I will I will I will gladly receive everyone's offer. Brilliant. I've I've volunteered everyone. <laughs> <laughs> They're here, so I know that they'll, they'll, they'll be they'll be inclusive. And whoever isn't, because we do have a number of people who listen in afterwards, I'm pretty sure that they too will listen because they're listening in. They have networks, and this is about expanding all of our networks. We're, we're, we're looking at it from the point of view of the academic. I do, and I 100% agree with you that that financial input through business and other people is also a vital part that needs to be played. And so it, it's our biggest challenge, I'll be honest. Yeah. We, we've, we've, we today have 50 student tuition fees covered. If I had the matching funds, we'd have 50 students that we could start right now and we don't and so that is that is our biggest challenge indeed so so this is what we need to do we need to we need this conversation to get out there we need this for for people to see it would be tremendously helpful please <laughs> yeah no no definitely and we'll, we'll spread it far and wide that we need we, we might need to have some kind of consortium or some kind of me yeah, another no, we, meeting. We, you know, we, we've got 14 universities who've stepped up. All 14 mm -hmm. are doing three students over the decade. They've committed 1.5 million. That is a significant donation by these universities in a time of pandemic. And they didn't have to, and they did. So they've stepped up. And what we need is, is businesses. A few of them have come forward and we are so grateful. But we need we need more than just this is a you know, really important initiative. We actually need skin in the game from the business. And that's an expression they'd understand. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Richard, I'm going to take this offline in a minute. Okay, okay. Right? But I'm going to just close off and just once again, thank you. And then- Very let kind know. for the invitation, thank no, you. I'm, I'm just so thankful that, that you came, All right? So um, let me just share my other screen. Okay, so for next week, um, we're going to have Shifu Heng Ri, who is a Shaolin um, martial arts master. And he's going to give us an idea about his sense of identity, sense of belonging um, in his space. So that will be a really interesting conversation as well to, to tune into. The other thing which I'd like to just highlight, if you haven't um, seen some of the other um, interviews before, you can go to tinyurl.com um, forward slash belonging dash IAO, our YouTube site, where you can see some more of these um, videos. But until um, next week, have a good weekend. And anyone wants to stay on for the after party, please do. Okay. Let me just stop the recording.